forearm controls the wrist, the bicep controls the elbow, muscles, joints. How do I get utilization out of my forearm while keeping the wrist in a strong position without breaking the wrist? So closer in the front, further into the side. Okay, look at the depth here, okay? Closer, but more in front. Further to the side. So that's pretty good stuff so far. This is actually probably one of the main points I wanted to make in this video, okay? And this is what it comes down to. When you're hitting a, with a Western grip, we talk about the strike zone for a Western grip is always higher, right? The Western grip strike zones, Western grips are known to just clobber these high balls. Whereas the Eastern Continental grips, they're better for the low balls. And if you don't really, I know we all kind of get this in principle, but you, I want you to understand from a really technical level, okay, because it's going to really explain a lot of the limitations with your game, how to structure your game moving forward. All right, so this Western grip, right? Again, keeping my wrist strong. It's looking good up here, up here, up here, up here. All right. But what happens, I'm going to come to the side of the net. What happens to my Western grip, see, my, to, when I, I start hitting the ball lower and lower and lower? Well, we talked about the strings being very closed off for a Western grip. So if... I got to get the ball up and over the net on this really low ball right here. I need to get the strings hitting that lower outside part of the ball. If I want to get the strings hitting that lower outside part of the ball, what happens to my wrist? It breaks. This is a position of weakness. I don't know if you played Western grips before and you see them on that low ball do all kinds of stuff like this just to try to lift the ball off the ground. It's a very tough proposition for a Western grip. You can get in trouble. So. What if, let's say I want to hit that lower outside quadrant of the ball to get the ball up and bend that ball up and in, okay? What if I just switch to an Eastern grip? See right on top? Now I go from cock to neutral, cock to neutral, cock to neutral. My wrist is very strong, and those Eastern grips, bang! I, I, they can handle that low ball with ease, all right? See those continental grips just pick the, that ball off the ground like it's nothing. They don't even need to bend their knees, all right? Now, the strength of the Eastern grip. What about... What happens, okay, to the Eastern, why isn't the Eastern grip just the perfect, per so we're going to look at the limitations of the Eastern grip, all right, it's pretty good here, it's pretty good here, all right, up to, ch up to like, uh, torso level, chest level, pretty good, but what happens when I start pushing past, what, what happens when I go too high with Eastern grip, what happens guys, L look at my body, what's wrong here, when I raise this contact point too high, what happens to my body mechanics? See, see my trap muscle right here? See how my traps lift up? So it traps down, traps up, traps down, traps up. Okay, and this is big for Eastern grip. This is what happened to me on my Eastern grip, all right? When you make contact with your traps up, you completely lose all your core strength. I want you to think about this when you lose your core strength. Let's say a, a, a boulder was rolling down the mountain about to crush me. I want to hold that thing up, right? You see in a position of strength, see how my shoulders are press down, okay, this helps me stay connected to my core. So right here, I'm pretty strong. Once I lift my trap, try pushing a boulder with my traps up like this, I just get crushed by that boulder, all right? So one of my coaches, he would always, it's not scientifically correct per se, but he would say like, in the socket, out of the socket, in the socket, <laughs> out of the socket, right? But when it's down, when these traps are down and this is elongated and relaxed, now you can see, as I hit, my, my core can stay engaged as opposed to the disconnect once my trap lifts up. So with the Eastern grip, man oh man, I lift that thing up and you get in big trouble. So, all right, well, let's look at this position with my traps lifted up, okay, position of weakness. Even though my wrist is in a good position, what would happen if from this Eastern grip, I switched to a Western grip, leaving the racket in the same place? Now... The pronation, I can keep my wrist from breaking in a Western grip for this high ball. And guys, that's a key. If, if you're a Western grip, you've got to hit this ball head level, eye level, maybe top of the head level. 
because Western Grips can just destroy this ball, right? Just like the Eastern Grip for that low ball hitting on the outside, Western Grips destroy this ball and I can pronate even slightly down and hit a hammer shot here, bang, bang, bang. Whereas Eastern, Eastern Grip, I can kind of level out my stroke. So you see Federer, he can level out his stroke a little bit and still hit a good penetrating ball from a, high a fairly high position, maybe shoulder height. But man, that ball, head level above your head, this is where the Western Grip really excels, okay? And so, obviously, look, trap lifted up, trap, relax. Now this is a position of strain. You see that? Okay. Let's try to watch Gasquet with his Eastern Grip level out this ball. Very tough. That's a tough shot for an Eastern Grip, and you can see it takes so much strength. Again, these high balls take so much strength and energy to, to get down. This is my Eastern Grip in these clips one more time. Oh, that's tough. Even a little bit lower, now I can hit it. Okay, that's one of my better forehands. The semi-western grip, they can get so much strength at that head level. Look, I'm I'm a little jealous. Not really, but you know, that's again, that's a strike zone change that allows you to with those semi-western western grips. This is a real hammer shot right here. Now this is many years ago, and I want to show you how to incorrectly hit a hammer shot, and this is what I used to do incorrectly. Now watch the racket path through contact. You're going to notice on this forehand, I'm still brushing the ball at contact. Again, in slow motion, see the racket is brushing. So I'm trying to hit the ball up and then down. When a proper hammer shot, this is a proper hammer shot, hits the ball directly down first where the pronation is supposed to go through the ball and flat. Now I want to throw out some examples for you guys. All right, I don't know if you remember the 2009 U.S. Open, Delpo played Rafa in the semifinals of the U.S. Open, and Delpo, I mean, he was just on that day, but he was crushing the ball so hard and heavy, the ball is staying super low and flat, and going, moving through, through Rafa's strike zone very quickly. And Nadal, I mean, again, when, he's, when Nadal is executing, he's executing, nothing can stop him, but that day, I mean, he's getting a lot of spin on his ball. But because it's just hard to consistently dig these low balls out that are hard and flat, he's leaving them short in the court, they're bouncing up, Delpo is just clobbering it. And sometimes you see that when Nadal plays Federer on these fast, slick indoor services and Federer is just driving the ball hard and flat and Nadal has a hard time keeping pushing Federer back and keeping him deep. He can hit the ball pretty well, it's just a little tougher, right? That's when Federer you know, some, will sometimes put the beat down on Rafa in those situations. Also, another example, okay, looking at the other end of the spectrum, if, when jo Djokovic went on his run, 2011, 2012-ish, around that time, one of the common plays I'd see him run on Federer was he'd rip the ball to Federer's backhand, he'd get Federer moving out wide on the backhand here, and then, instead of just hitting a rally ball to the other side, Djokovic would hit a ball with a little bit more height, he'd land it short in the court, it'd bounce up high, and he'd make Federer with that eastern grip, have to hit this ball kind of like like this above his head. Sorry guys, the Djokovic ones came out a little too blurry, but these running forehands, high, still very tough. It's, it's hard to get the strength up there for that, especially those Eastern Continental grips. Imagine McEnroe trying to return Nadal's shot that comes up that high in the strike zone. Federer would leave it short, Djokovic would eat his lunch. Now guys, funny enough, I'm using the two gr the greatest players of, of all time, but I just want to demonstrate the limitations of the body. Now, look, if you give Federer a high forehand, he's gonna hit a winner on you. If you give Nadal a low forehand, he's probably gonna hit, hit a winner on you too. And these guys, through amazing athleticism, coordination, strength training, practice, reps, perfect technique, perfect footwork, they've overcome these limitations. They can get around it, okay? For most of us, it's a little tougher, okay? Now, I do wanna throw up some solutions because you know for me to just give you all problems and not solutions well not very kind of me so one of the things let's say you're hitting with the western grip all right and well obviously that low ball is tough one solution move get your feet in position move your feet up faster so you don't hit that low ball but if that low ball comes switch that slice remember a slice has incredible range of motion uh, sorry incredible range of motion and a much much larger strike zone. So I can slice without breaking my wrist. Same with the Eastern Grip forehand. A lot of times when I switch to an Eastern Grip forehand, I would go to slice up here 
right for that ball. Instead of lifting up my trap, I'd slice the ball to bring it down back low because I wanted that game to be nice and low for me for that Eastern grip. Eastern grip loves low balls. And also, if I hit a really good slice and it stays low, it's hard to get that ball back up high to the forehand and I can attack the next ball. Another solution, again, reverse forehand. I'll link you to the, my other video, especially for that Western grip, the reverse forehand to help you get those strings facing more up. That's a really good one. A big one, common sense, but not very well implemented a lot of the time. Okay, this ball is tough for a Western grip. Okay, and then we're talking about thigh level here. What if, what if I just bent my knees? Oh, now I can cover, cover balls that are pretty low. All right, bend your knees will help. How about, the, let's look at the flip side, that Eastern grip, shoulder ball, top of my strike zone. But you see Fed all the time, he, he'll jump to raise that strike zone six inches a foot. And that's a big difference when it comes to strike zone. So those are some solutions around that. But think about it, guys. You have to understand this because that's not your optimal. Let's say if I made you dig balls out low like this every time, or if I made you jump up an extra six inches to foot every time you hit, those aren't ideal solutions over time. You get tired, it takes more energy, you make more errors over time and over a long course of the match, it's gonna make a big difference. Okay, so know your strike zone and know exactly what you're doing, know how to adjust. Push yourself in the best situations to win. All right, so that's some pretty good stuff right there. We talked about the height of the strike zone and why that matters and, and how that matters, the mechanics behind that. But there's not just height of strike zone that changes when you use different grips. There's something called the depth of your strike zone changes slightly. All right, this one is actually a little, not as long, a little easier to understand. So again, if my video on fixing your aim, I talk, I talk about this concept a little bit more in depth. So please go do that. These videos are kind of related, but when I, Whenever I hit, right, I want my shoulder to be behind the to be behind contact because my body mass can be behind contact when my shoulder is behind contact. If it, my shoulder wasn't behind contact, I'd be punching across my body like this. It'd be this would be a weak swing. But right here, now this is my position of strength. Ah, when I hit when I hit through the, through the shot, okay. So this is my position of strength for Western grip. This is where I'm strong behind the body, right? But if I were to leave the racket in the same position and switch to an Eastern grip, do you see now that when, this, when my muscles are tight, when my upper body is tight and cramped, this is not a relaxed position. I'm not going to get strength. I'm not going to get speed if I'm not relaxed. Again, your body can get strength and speed when you're relaxed. All right? So instead of hitting the ball in the same position of the Western grip, I need to actually hit the ball a little further from my body now this is much elongated, this can stay relaxed as I'm hitting through the ball versus uh, being jammed like this. All right, so the Western grip swing a little closer to my body, but the ball is more in front. Eastern grip swing, the racket, the ball is it's further from my body and more to the side. Does that make sense? So closer and in front, further into the side. Okay, look at the depth here, okay? Closer, but more in front further to the side. So you see Federer hit out here, or you see, you see Federer get this extension out here. You see the Western grips almost get a little closer to the ball to make contact here. And it's, it's big to know on these grips, okay? Obviously, if you were to hit a Western grip to the side of your body like this, like this, you're breaking your wrist. You, you, it has to be in front to keep the strong wrist position, right? And use the wrist in, in the proper way. I know I like to repeat myself, but again, poor spacing and tracking, hand-eye, foot-eye coordination, throw technique out the window if look at this is jam. He can still hit a pretty good shot, right, because of his technique, but he's compensating. And also, look, if I'm playing him and he's not well-spaced and he's not unbalanced, I can read where he's hitting. Here's our side-by-side. -side. On the left side, we have a grip more on the western side of the spectrum, right side, eastern side of the spectrum. Now, I want you to observe the arm extension here and where the elbow is. Obviously, we're gonna look at the two factors, 
the, the wrist and then that keeping that trap down and that's going to determine the strike zone. Now notice guys with the more eastern grip, the extension and hitting strong keeping, again this is a little slower, keeping that trap down, okay, and the spacing here, that trap down being a position of strength. That western grip, the western grips have no problem keeping the trap down, but you want that contact where that wrist is strong, okay, notice the difference again in spacing and a little is a lot guys strikes when an inch or two makes a big difference all right now it's hard to tell with naked eye sometimes and again even with the more western grip you can still hit somewhat flat by keeping those strings very level one of the reasons i would like to jack sock because as an example because he's got that full western grip as you can see the ball is very much out in front of him because he's got to get get that shoulder behind the ball his body mass behind the ball while not breaking his wrist fed he's still behind the ball but slightly more to the side you see that elongation with his ch chest see once that trap starts coming up he starts moving his chest around fed keeps it at center point super still so there's some different advantages disadvantages that you should know about when i hit this eastern grip okay especially on these these wide balls it's very easy for me to pull the ball across the court and get on the outside of the ball here all right because western grip I need to get my body all the way around here to get on the outside. Right? It's a little tougher. I'm using an extreme western. Whereas like an eastern grip, I can really get on the outside part of the ball. Sometimes you've even seen Federer like on the run hit a ball that's almost even behind him in the strike zone like this. Like his strike zone can go really far back and, and get the ball cross court. It's incredible. Right? On the flip side, when you see Roger hit that inside in or inside out, because he needs more space here, he has to actually get really far around it. Again, you see that beautiful extension, but he has to actually c cover more ground and get it really far around the ball. Compared to the Western grips, the ball can be right here, and they don't need to get as far around for the inside in, inside out. The ball can be, the, the, strike, the strike zone is close to the body, and they can just turn on it. So, I mean, it's my opinion. I think the, the Western grip has a little bit more advantage with inside in, inside out, right, and vice versa with the wide ball. So we know that the more western grips can't get this type of extension, but again, this same extension causes Federer to have to space a little bit more liberally when he's hitting inside in and inside out. And a lot of times Fed will, I mean, he get pulled off the court, and you know, that looks beautiful, he's one of the best in the world, but compare that to Rafa's spacing on the inside in and inside out, a little bit closer, and so again, I think the advantage to the western grips but but and Rafa could hit this shot as well he can technically hit this shot but he can't hit it quite as far back in his strike zone as his low outside ball here I'm going to show you a few more Federer can hit that ball behind him get that lower out, outside quadrant and really bend the ball in like no one else can okay a west group would have to take that a little bit further in front of his body this is a great one to see here just because he's moving out wide and he can still get this cross court, this is so far back in the strike zone having to go a sharp cross court. So thanks so much guys. That's a wrap for this video. See you on part three.